Hey, Scott here, and I want to do a little bit to talk about the Venezuelan elections. For those who have not paid any attention, this is a major event going on right now. There was just a snap election in Venezuela, and the ruling party has come out, according to the government and the election process, as getting 51% of the vote. There are now uprisings in the country and protests because a lot of people are disputing this, as you can imagine, as often happens, and uh, there is the potential for an eruption of violence there. We have no idea what's going to happen. This is unfolding pretty rapidly. But so this is important local news. But if you live in the West, you're going to be inundated with information that the election is fraudulent. And while I have absolutely no information, this is important, I have zero information about the election process. I'm not speaking to it. I have no idea who is liked or disliked in the country. I can tell you that one party is liked and disliked by different people, right? We know that. But I know nothing of, I have no deep information of Venezuela. But there are some bits of information that are super important as global citizens that I think it's important to understand because I do have information about things like the United States and how it reacts under different conditions. And those things tell us a bit about what's going on in Venezuela. So before we get into international reactions, I want to talk about what we can expect from the Venezuelan elections in general. One, Maduro has been in power for 11 years, and the country has been suffering greatly. However, most of the suffering that has come during that time comes from U.S. sanctions, not from and international sanctions, not from things happening in the country itself. So this is important. This is not a failure of a government to rule its people. This is a direct attack on the people by outside forces blaming the government that is there. So because of that, and you can like or dislike the sanctions, you can like or dislike the government, none of that is relevant to this point. The point is, is that if you are Venezuelan and you're looking at what's going on, you may be very happy with your government representing the people and very unhappy with the international community for uh, mistreating the Venezuelan people. Or you may blame the government for causing the international community to attack you know, the, the people of Venezuela. Of course, it makes absolutely no sense if anyone believed that the government was not actually representing the people to create a medical and uh, uh, food emergency for the people. Clearly, the actions of the international community are not that of uh, wanting to help Venezuelan citizens. So that we know, right? There is no international sanctions that are there for the purpose of protecting Venezuelans. They are there taking advantage of an excuse to harm Venezuelans. That much we know. That's just a fact, and that is common. We expect that with most sanctions. There's very rarely a time that sanctions are there to change internal policy. That doesn't make any sense. Now, sanctions on Russia to try to stop a war in Ukraine, that makes a little bit more sense because you're trying to get the local people to change foreign policy. That's something that you care about and that sanctions can affect. But sanctions affecting internal, oh, we're saying, oh, you voted for this person, but they didn't they, they didn't honor your vote, so we're gonna punish you for being punished. That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. That is not what's happening, right? They are using this as an excuse, that we know. So there's very good reasons to expect people to have either opinion inside the country, and mostly it's gonna be dictated by how much propaganda they hear. Could be internal propaganda, blaming the outside forces. It could be outside propaganda, blaming blaming internal forces, but we have a lot of blame going on for a major problem. What this is known to generally cause is a high degree of volatility in voting. So the opposition had said they were expecting to see a landslide in today's elections, and they have reasonable reason to claim a, a cause for this to happen, right? Not just that they have a survey that suggests it, but they have logic behind why it could happen. And the incumbent government has good reasons to say the same thing, that they're expecting a landslide or at least a victory, and they have some logic why it may be true. And what's actually true, we have no idea. Unlike like someplace like the United States, where we have really large numbers that basically guarantee that the swing can only be by a few percentages. In something like the current Venezuelan situation, we can expect the potential for the swing to be by 20 or 30 or possibly even 40 percent instead of two, three, or maybe four percent. So it's a wildly different situation. So that the opposition is claiming that they believe they should have won by 70 percent. That's not actually a crazy number, but that they didn't win, even though they may have legitimately thought that also isn't a crazy number. So we're left with, from the outside, being able to look at this, knowing that it could be very volatile, yes, but knowing in what way and which way we expect someone to win? No, we don't have that information. Now, the international community is using a lack of transparency as a reason to say that the uh, election is potentially fraudulent. And with a lack of transparency, that does open the door for a lot of claims of fraudulence. However, it's important to note that other than the opposition simply claiming that they think they should have won, there hasn't been anyone who said anything that actually indicates a uh, doubt as to the elections 
just that not enough information has been given yet, and so we're currently in a state of waiting. This, of course, doesn't mean much of anything, but it does open the door for protests and potential uprisings inside the country. It's creating excuses. So what we're seeing at this point is a number of powerful countries who have a announced, like they're very public, about that they there are certain results they will accept from the election and certain ones they won't. It doesn't matter who votes. They don't care what the vote is. There are certain things they're going to uh, try to overthrow and certain things they won't. And they are beginning to set things up as expected. So none of this is a surprise. None of this is unexpected. We knew if the existing government was to legitimately win the election that this is exactly what we would see. But if they didn't legitimately win the election, it's also exactly what we would see. So the behavior that we're seeing from outside uh, entities, from the United States government, from the UK government and so forth, tells us very little. It tells us what we already knew, that no matter what happened in these elections, unless the opposition that the United States backs came into power cleanly, that they were going to call the elections fraudulent, no matter how transparent they are, no matter how honest they were, it doesn't matter. So it doesn't mean that they weren't fraudulent, but it does mean that nothing that we are seeing from the outside suggests that they aren't. It's all expected behavior by entities who use the claim of fraudulence to try to overthrow other governments on a regular basis. They have a track record of this to the point where we can almost use it as an assumption that they believe it to be legitimate. If the United States and UK actually doubted the veracity of the Venezuelan elections, they probably would react differently because it would throw them off. They have such a playbook for claiming uh, that, that things are not as they are. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we see agencies getting involved, such as the Carter Agency. And it's worth noting that Jimmy Carter's claim to fame as president was he was one of the presidents who, in the 1970s, was involved in the assassination of American journalists and in the attempt to uh, maintain U.S.-backed anti-democratic dictatorships in Latin America. Jimmy Carter is a brand name of election fraud in Latin America, and that his legacy is now stepping in and getting involved is an incredible, incredible level of, of statement that we can assume that because the, the Carter agency is starting to question the elections that they believe they are legitimate, they are not an agency. There's no person who would take a job and be associated with Jimmy Carter who believes in legitimate elections. This is an agency whose function, just like Jimmy Carter with international elections, his goal was to interfere with elections. So this is where we actually see a really strong indication that the players who only step in when elections are legitimate and they attempt to uh, defraud the people to stir up trouble based on that, they're starting to come into play. So that is a major indicator. If the elections were truly fraudulent, you would expect, not guaranteed, but you would expect that the major world powers would allow things to play out because the natural selection of things would at least make for a really strong argument in most cases to show that they were fraudulent and then they could step in and do whatever they want to do. But that they're stepping in immediately suggests that they are at least very cautiously pessimistic that they may actually be legitimate elections. And that's why they need to start creating fear, uncertainty, and doubt now, because they know that it may not get created on its own. Now, these are not the strongest indicators, right? These are, even if the uh, election was fraudulent, these players would still get involved in similar ways. So it doesn't tell us a lot. But what we do know as absolute fact is that players like the US, the Carter Agency, and the United Kingdom are places that do not honor democracy. None of these are democracies on their own. One is not even a government, but the other two, the US is about as far from democracy as you can reasonably get. It has uh, an election where it is relatively simple and twice in my voting lifetime, someone who lost the majority still won the vote. It's about as anti-democratic as you could theoretically theoretically get. The entire point of a democracy is for the people to decide, and they did the opposite twice. Now, they don't always do the opposite, but they did twice. But if the people vote, and even if they follow all the laws, there's still another system, the Electoral College, to completely ignore the vote, should they just want to. And in the current elections that we have coming up, we already see, and in the past too, all kinds of things that constitute fraud or near fraud, all the things that people accuse other governments are, is all going on in the U.S. All right? Opposition claiming that they actually won when we think they didn't, but no one knows. Uh, people winning with a minority vote. Uh, and now we have a new presidential candidate for the Democratic Party who was selected by something like only 2,000 people. How democratic is that in a country of 
350 million that one of only two reasonable candidates for gov for for president was selected by a handful of people and nobody even those in the party had really any say whatsoever in the process and even that was all dictated by just one person deciding if that decision by 2000 people could take place the degree to which the united states is not an example of democracy and in no way supports democracies worldwide can't be overstated this is one of the most extreme things about the american government the uk similarly has a wacky form of semi-democracy they still have a monarch that no one selects isn't even a member of their country uh, overseas people the royal family is famous for being associated with human trafficking and other major crimes, uh, covering up massive, massive corruption. And a lot of the government is still selected out of the nobility, not by election, the number of people who are actually truly elected through some kind of semi-democratic process, while there is some, is relatively minor and is completely a, a mockery of democratic systems. And they had what we call ratchet votes. These are fundamentally non-democratic things, such as the Brexit, where they simply kept forcing a vote on the same item over and over again until the guaranteed results that they wanted to have happened. If you look at how the Brexit happened, they only allowed one opportunity to vote to become a member of the European Union, but they offered unlimited numbers of votes over time to vote to leave, but they can never vote to return. This is a great example of where they use voting to pretend to have democracy, but there's no actual democracy mathematically in a ratchet vote. Yes, you can't guarantee which time you vote that you're going to make the decision to, in this case, Brexit, but it was guaranteed that given enough opportunities to vote that eventually they were going to do it. The powers that be created a system where it was guaranteed that over time a vote would take place over and over again until the desired result was essentially guaranteed. It just couldn't be guaranteed exactly when it would happen, but that the people had the option to go into Brexit was a one-time decision but the option to go out was a permanent recurring one means that it was a guaranteed solution. So ratchet votes are used by anti-democratic systems to make it appear like they're actually taking votes and listening to the people. But if you actually look at how the vote works, it's anything. But places like the U.S. and U.K. have quite literally spent centuries using propaganda and misinformation campaigns to essentially gaslight their populaces generation after generation into having no concept of democracy or freedom and to make them actively act as enemies to it worldwide. So when we see countries like the US and UK stepping in and having strong commentary about an election that they don't like, it tells us extremely little but is suggestive that if they're unhappy, that the results were good for the people. It doesn't guarantee that, but it does suggest it. So I just want you to think critically about when you look at things like the Venezuelan election, that there's a lot of information that's being missed. There's some just general information. Yes, we don't know how the election went. I don't know how you ever find out how elections went anywhere. Even in the U.S., millions of people don't trust the election process. And of course, no matter what you vote for, we all don't trust the results because it doesn't mean anything. So that's where it gets weird because in places like Venezuela, the complaints from places like the US and UK are that they didn't honor the vote. That's policy in the US and UK. So, wow, talk about the pot calling the kettle black. Now, when places that are actually democratic step in and have some opinion, well, maybe we can consider their opinions, but we need to also question how loyal they are to superpowers who may be strong arming them into saying what they want them to say. Uh, it's difficult when you're looking at foreign relations to understand who actually disbelieves the results of an election versus who just doesn't like what the results were and or they simply have to look like they're towing the line to their military party partners who are very much controlling what their public opinion is allowed to be. So just think critically, look at what we're being told and realize that just because a lot of people we know will feed us misinformation, feed us misinformation doesn't make that misinformation true. Just because they're shouting at us, the volume suggests they don't believe it themselves. So if they don't believe it, why should we? Thanks for joining me. See you next time.